all for coming out. Let me, uh, I'll just start off and tell you a little bit of who I am and then why I'm running, obviously, and I, most of the faces in the room I, I know. And so, but uh, I'll have plenty of Q&A, and, a, and I, I try to set myself apart from my competition right off the bat. Uh, everything I say when I talk is true, right? I believe it to be true. I believe in the truth with a capital T, and uh, I believe in the truth that comes out of that prayer right there. So anyway, along the talk, if you think I'm saying something that's not true, just raise your hand, right? And stop me right there. So I like to set myself apart that way right up front. I'm going to do Q&A at the end. But uh, there's too much, there's negative ads going on. My competitor, Eric Cannon, is running these nasty things on Fox News at night. They're just blatantly false. You can go look it up, and I'm going to take questions on that. But I like setting up the talk that way. So let me tell you a little who I am, and then uh, we'll get to why I'm running and, and answer any questions you may have. So I'm Dave Brack. I'm running for uh, Congress against Eric Cannon in a primary June 10. It's not a convention, and so please spread that also. It's a primary. You just go to your voting precinct. And the other side will probably try to muddy the waters and make it more complex than that, but it's not. It's an open primary. Anyone can vote. And so uh, bring your neighbors, drag your neighbors, drag your friends, drag your bowling league, your church club, whoever you know. Or drag them out to the polls on, on June 10. And uh, so I grew up in the Midwest, uh, went to a small uh, liberal arts college, Hope College, much like Randolph-Macon, studied business. I worked at Arthur Anderson in Detroit and Chicago for a couple of years in information consulting. And then uh, while I was in Detroit, I uh, felt the call to uh, go to seminary. Went to Princeton Seminary for three years, got a master's in divinity. While I was there, I went on a uh, political semester down to Wesley Seminary. And a uh, very bunch of liberal, uh, well-intentioned clergy in D.C., but super liberal. And uh, the, the one thing that struck me way back then, this was 25 years ago or so, right? The, uh, the clergy, the, they were learning the ropes. And there's an efficient way to solve problems. And the first thing they said they wanted to do now is call, write to congressman. I said, that's strange for clergy, right? I mean, you rely on God and the family and, and your self-sufficiency and all those things. It's, it just struck me as odd. And now later on, we see kind of the result of that, right? The, the first recourse, it is efficient because up in D.C., everything's in trillions and hundreds of billions, right? So if you want a bunch of money quick, you just write to congressman. But every nation on the face of this earth, all of human history shows us one thing. If you depend on the king and on central government up there, your nation will fail eventually, right? If you do not rely on individual effort, and then if you need help, you go to your family, and then if you need help, you go to your organizations, your civil, your civic associations, right? Rotaries, I spoke at a rotary today. And then you go to your churches, and then as a government, you first of all start at the local level. Right? And then maybe the state level, if you got some big issues to work on. And at the federal level, I think everyone here uh, believes in the United States Constitution. And at the federal level, there's enumerated powers. They're only allowed to have certain powers at the federal level, right, in the Constitution. And we can get into that later. And so that's what this race is about. These days, everyone in D.C. just wants to immediately go, like, just write your congressman, have them solve your problems, and send tons of money for every project under the sun. Right? And, and who gets that money? Do you all get that money, or only people with wealthy lawyers? Right? Just the wealthy lawyers. So that's, I learned that way back when. So I, I, I knew I had a calling to, I wanted to teach ethics and philosophy and systematic theology was my, was my thing to college students. But while I was there, I, uh, I saw, I, I felt a, another calling, and that's to combine economics with ethics. So I went and pursued my Ph.D. in economics at American University, spent five years doing that. Met my wife up there, that's probably the most important thing. And uh, worked for the U.S. Army a little bit in economics, and then uh, moved. I applied only to small Division three schools with church affiliations, and was lucky enough, uh, maybe guided by a little Providence as well, to Randolph-Macon, and I, I just love it there. Right? I got too many liberal colleagues, but I still love it. Right? So, <laughs> so I've been there 18 years teaching economics and ethics. And uh, I was chair of the department for the last six years. And then politically, I've been involved. I've been on the Economic uh, Board of Revenue Estimates. Eric Cantor's using that in the Fox News ads, right? We meet once a year. We do revenue estimates. You go tell your neighbors and tell your friends. All we do is give an uh, estimate of how fast the U.S. economy is going to grow and how fast the Commonwealth is going to grow. And that has implications for revenues. But by Virginia law, in the code, I'm, I'm on a board, advisory board, and the advisor term, uh, in law says I'm not allowed to do tax policy and all that. So Eric Cantor is just flat out lying on that thing when he tries to link uh, my being.
writing on that board to tax policy and Tim Kaine and all this thing. I wasn't paid. Tim Kaine wasn't my boss. I'm not his handpicked protege. I never talked to him, if that gives you any hint as to what was going on. I never talked to Tim Kaine. And so uh, spread that and tell the truth to your uh, neighbors on that. He's hoping that with millions of dollars, uh, he can just spread falsehoods and win for low information voters and don't know what's going on. And I just read on my uh, webpage, as I was searching, uh, Floyd Bain, who ran against Eric last time, Eric did the exact same thing to him. And so Floyd's calling him out and saying, here's what he did to me. Uh, don't let him do it again. It's the same old talking points over and over and over. But well, I don't want to spend too much time on that. So I, I was on that uh, governor's board. I'm on the board of accountancy. He hasn't smeared me with that. I guess the accountants have a better name or something. Right? So, uh, I'm on the board of accountancy as well under McDonald. And I'm on the governor's thing under McDonald. And I worked in uh, the General Assembly for years on education issues. Tried to get uh, special ed kids more choice, right? Vouchers so they have school choice uh, to get away from the top down federal government, uh, no child left behind, and all that kind of stuff. And so that's roughly speaking who I am. Why am I running? I'm running because Washington, D.C. is just absolutely broken, right? From head to toe, just everything is broken up there. And every federal program is insolvent, they're bankrupt, right? I'm not making this up. You go out to the Board of Trustees for Social Security and Medicare. And they're bankrupt, and they, and they know it. So let's go through a little of that. Uh, first of all, the financial system is broken. And what does that mean? Usually, you go into recessions, like back in 08, and you go down, and then you jump back up. And did we ever jump back up? We never jump back up, right? So why is that? Because we're in a financial crisis, and that's a technical term. Right? So there's a book out, uh, a new scholarship on financial crises. We actually broke the financial system. Right? We broke the banking system. All the investment banks up in uh, New York and D.C., whatever, those guys should have gone to jail. Instead of going to jail, where'd they go? They went on to Eric's Rolodex. Right? <laughs> that's where they all are. And they're sending him big checks. And uh, so uh, that's a challenge. We're going to have to overcome that. And we can overcome that with people. Right? Some guy asked me on the radio this week. He said, well, he, he could tell he's going to poke it at me. Well, he's got $2 million, and you don't have $2 million, so how are you going to do that? And I said, well, the good news is uh, money doesn't vote, people do. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So I said, I got people. And I don't think Eric's got any volunteers at all. I seriously don't. The Republican Party, please join. And I'm going to get into that in a minute. But uh, they have no people and no pulse right now. <clears throat> They're just fried, right? Because if you don't believe in a vision, if you don't have a vision in your head that's optimistic and about the future and built on principle, it's hard to get excited. So the Tea Party, the grassroots, uh, is built on principle. Uh, you got a vision. I agree with that vision, right? The Constitution and free markets. I'll get into all that. You know, that's what we're running on. And people are excited about that. People are getting out and volunteering by the hundreds for that. The Republicans are just, they're selling out those principles. And I'll make that real clear uh, coming right up. So uh, Eric is running on one set of principles. He's running on the Chamber of Commerce and the Business Roundtable of Principles. And a guy was nice enough to write that up in the Wall Street Journal on January 14. The chairman of AT&T wrote up the Chamber of Commerce, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, their principles. And the number one thing they want is stability in Washington, D.C. Right? So they want stability. Well, what does that mean if you want st they want stable financial markets so they can make profits? And I like profits. Right? I'm an economist. I'm pro-business, I'm not against big business, but I'm against big business in bed with big government. Yeah. And that's what's going on, right? And everybody knows that's what's going on. And uh, so they want stability, and what does that really mean? It means let's kick the can down the road on every major issue there is, right? Let's just wait a few more years on the debt. Should we pay off the debt now or just kick the can down and wait a few more years? <clears throat> i got to have a young guy. What's your name? Thomas. Thomas? Do you like that, Thomas? <laughs> <laughs> no, he doesn't. That's very good. Dad, would you rather have a dollar or owe a dollar? Would you rather have a Coca-Cola or have to give someone else a Coca-Cola? That's good. You're honest, Newman. He's honest. That's very good. I like you. You're a good man. Dad, uh, man. And the reason I bring up Thomas is because who's going to pay off the debt? That generation, we're just lobbing it on to these guys, right? And America has always been an optimistic place. Uh, Reagan, I love Reagan because he was always optimistic about our future. I am optimistic, right? If we get rid of this D.C. crew up there, I'm optimistic.
optimistic about the American people. So kick the can down the road. Uh, they got a 2.2 and 3. But what else does the chamber want? They want amnesty. And what does that mean? That means uh, illegal immigrants come in, they're granted citizenship, and it's in the millions, right? The numbers are 40 million is what the, the big number is uh, coming in. So if you add 40 million workers to our labor supply right now, labor markets are already a mess. What will happen to the wage rate for the average American? That's going to go down. People are going to lose jobs, right? And this, these are to folks who have broken the law, right? Legal immigration is very different than illegal, right? Very different. And so the chamber is doing that. <coughs> Aaron made on the Sunday shows a few weeks ago on uh, with uh, Major Garrett. What channel is that? ABC. Major Garrett. Major kept asking him over and over and over. He said, "Will you please explain to us your Republican principles on immigration reform?" And Eric wouldn't explain it. Three times, Major started getting mad. I, I brought him on the show to explain this set of issues. Why aren't you explaining it to us? And do you have any guess as to why Eric wouldn't explain it? Because 95% of the people in the 7th District don't want it. Right. Right? And so if he has to run on his record, he's in big trouble. Right? So, and cheap labor is just the beginning of it. Uh, if we bring in illegal immigrants and there's a skills mismatch, right? And then we're going to have to pay benefits and education, welfare, da 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 da. And there's numbers on all this Heritage Foundation. This is like, I can bore you to death with stats on that one for a half hour. But who's going to pick up the tab for all those unexpected costs? You are, right? Is big business going to pay for that? So big business gets the cheap labor, and the American people pay the tab. It's unbelievable, right? And I'm not against the rest of the world. I teach third world economic development, right? For 20 years, I want the rest of the world to do well. After World War II, what did we do to the Germans and the Japanese, our arch enemies? Absolutely corrupt regimes, evil regimes. And what do we do to them? We rebuilt them under martial plan. And how'd that work out for us? Not good. Uh, I, I know. Now these days a little, but pretty, pretty good. We want they they grow, we grow, we trade. Y'all get richer unless they start cheating on the trade agreements. Right? So China right now is growing. Do we want them to implode and crash tomorrow? I don't think so. If they implode, we get hurt. Right? So we want everybody to get rich. Uh, the Republican Party is often called uh, unloving, uncaring, uh, not generous, or whatever, and that's a bunch of baloney. Right? We're the party that believes in free markets. Uh, China, for the first time in world history, is feeding 1.2 billion people. And India, for the first time in world history, is feeding 1 billion people. You want to know why that is? One reason. What's the reason? Free markets. Right? Due to free markets. It's unbelievable, right? Russia under Putin has a flat tax rate, and we don't. The communists have a flat tax rate, right? You can't make this stuff up. China's growing. They're going toward free markets, and the United States is going toward more regulation by the minute, right? We're turning into a regulatory state. And so Eric is pursuing that vision. I, I have another vision. Uh, it's called the Republican Creed. And uh, for people in this room, you'll go when you're looking at me cross cycle. Right? But uh, there's just one problem with the Republican creed. The Republicans don't follow it. Right? So that, that's in the, the, the Tea Party creed, the grassroots creed is identical uh, to that creed. And I'll just go through it point by point. I'll go through it pretty quickly so you can get home and have dinner if you haven't. And I don't keep you here all night. But I, it is important to go through this point by point by point because this is what the election's about. And Eric claims to be a Republican. Right? So I'm running as a, as a conservative, right? And so let's go through it one by one. Republican creed, point one, we believe in free markets. Uh, Fannie and Freddie wrote two-thirds of all subprime mortgages. Go over that real slow in your head for a minute. Fannie and Freddie up in D.C., it's a mini mafia, right? There's books on this. This guy Johnson set up this mini across all states, and it was untouchable. You could not touch this system of massive money, how they spread Fannie and Freddie. And so they did two-thirds of all subprime high-risk mortgages. So who didn't do the mortgages? Bankers. So they put bankers out of business. And bankers, instead of doing mortgages, started doing what? Creating these new, fancy, exotic, crazy products. 
right? That led to the, so it went from the housing crisis, turned into the financial crisis, because bankers do banking, right? So they had to do something, so they started making up crazy stuff. And so we went from a housing crisis to a financial crisis. And what were our Republicans doing during this time period? Any, any, any commentary on Fannie and Freddie ahead of time from free market people? They don't know what free markets are, and they really do not. Right? The Republican leadership does not understand what free markets are. And people in this room, I think, do understand the connection between big fundamental issues. This country's success, in my view, is built on three big pillars. One is the Judeo-Christian tradition, right? religious and moral tradition. That led to the rule of law in the United States Constitution. Right? James Madison went to Princeton Seminary. That's one of the reasons I chose to go there. Right? He studied Hebrew, he read the Bible, he had a view of human nature, and that view of human nature led him to write the United States Constitution. Right? And so the Judeo-Christian tradition, the rule of law, and then Adam Smith and free markets, and it all goes together. Because free markets go together with freedom of conscience. Right? I don't have to force you to live a certain way. You're free to pursue whatever you want to do. Right? That's, that's, that's freedom. All of those three pillars go together. So the free market system, Eric Cantor has voted recently for the Farm Bill. Uh, does the Farm Bill help small, all-American mom-and-pop farmers? All, most of all the money goes to <coughs> big agriculture, right, food stamps, etc. He voted for the flood insurance program, not a free market. He votes for the Export-Import Bank. None of these are free market institutions. Right? So if you want to know why the country isn't growing, that's one reason. All right, second point in the Republican creed is uh, we believe in equal treatment under the law for all people. Equal treatment for everybody under the law. Equal justice for everybody. Uh, I could go over NSA, IRS targeting of who? You. You. I can't wait to see my tax audit. <laughs> I, I, got, I got too many friends with all you, right? You know, IRS is going to be on my case big time. I better have a real good CPA this year. Right? But it, it's kind of funny on one level, but the fact that I actually do have to be scared of the federal government coming after me, that's un American, right? It is so un American, I can't say it. Right? And politicians, they know how to do it just right. Hey, go take a look. I didn't tell you, but go take a look. At go take a look. Right? And that's what's going on. So equal treatment under the law, let me give you the smoking gun of this campaign. Go out and tell your neighbors, tell 50 friends about this, and I win the election. 50 new friends over the next 30 days. It's called the Stock Act. And I'm not making this up. Go Google it. CNN reported on this. Uh, after the financial crisis, there was a nice bill going through called the Stock Act. It was going to end insider trading by members of Congress and their families. Seems like a good thing to me. What happens if you do insider trading? You go to jail. What happened to Martha Stewart when she did it? Right? So that bill was making its way through, and one congressman stopped it and changed the language so that the family members and spouses could still do insider trading. Any guesses on who that might be? That, that is an impeachable offense, in my view. Right? That's like Johnny cheating in the back row of my economics class. Right? If you get caught cheating one time, how many times have you cheated? Uh, many. And that's a big one. That's not some little one. That's, he's basically saying, I'm special, my family's special, under law, and we get to do this and you don't. I, I can't comprehend doing that. Right? So go share that, not with the same 50 people in this room. Share that with 50 new people in your basketball team or your bowling league or your church group or whatever. And just say, do you agree with that or not? Right? What do you make of someone who would do that? And just let them answer. And the, the answer is obvious. Right? So equal treatment under the law. Uh, principle three of the Republican creed. How are we doing on Republican principles so far? You like them so far? Yeah. <laughs> They're not bad. Right? If anyone would follow them. Uh, we'd have a good country. Third principle is called fiscal responsibility. You like that? And, and it is a joke, right? To say that, it's a joke right now. So 17, go out to the U.S. debt clock, 17 trillion dollars, 17 and a half, it's spinning faster than you can see. 
That the numbers are just cycling faster than you can keep up with. Go to the bottom of that, and the biggest number in the economics textbooks now is $127 trillion in unfunded liabilities. Right? So go to the bottom and add up Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and the Bush prescription drug plan. $127 trillion in unfunded, unfunded liabilities. That's not the cost of the programs. That's just the unfunded part in law. Right? And all these pro programs are insolvent. They're bankrupt. We can't pay for them. Uh, by 2048, not that far off, those four programs alone take up the entire federal budget. The entire federal budget. Right? So no more military spending, no more judiciary, no more anything. Those four programs take up the whole budget. Has any leader you know on the Republican side or Democrat side mentioned that number to you in public? Right? I haven't heard anyone ever say yes in a talk yet. Yeah, good. Yeah, there are good. There are good. Good. Yeah, right. There's, right. And there are a few. Mosh and a few. Right. There's a few of them that are doing some work. Right. But if the biggest numbers and the biggest problems we have, if leadership. Right, and the leadership on the Republican side, right, Boehner, Canner, and on the Democrat side, they don't even want to go there. Right, if they won't mention the biggest problem, then it's not leadership. Right? So a lot of people say, well, Eric's so powerful. How can you dare challenge us? Such a powerful man. Right? Well, because that power is doing what? Kicking the can down the road. The person with a powerful position is not using the powerful position. To solve the problem. Not even that. He's not, he's probably bullying the other Republicans. To, uh, well, no, it, it, right, it's all, right. I mean, that's what I'm talking He is doing it. Right, and I'll, I'll get, yeah, well, let, let's go to that one. All right, let's do more on fiscal responsibility following. He, the leadership is coaxing others to vote in a certain way. So let's go over that. Debt ceiling increases. Debt's going up and up and up. Republicans can block that. Right? The, the uh, House of Representatives, two-year terms for a reason. They're the body that's closest to the people. So they are also given the power of the purse for a reason, because they're closest to the people. So Eric has voted for 10 of the last 14 debt ceiling increases. Right? So some people say, well, give Eric another, give him a chance, Dave. You're so unfair. You're, you're kind of unfair to Eric. Right? Give him another chance. Once they get the Senate, they're going to do everything right. There's only one problem with that argument. Uh, back in 02, the Republicans had the House and the Senate and the White House. And Eric voted for the debt ceiling increase then. And in 03, and in 04, and in 06, and 07. So should we trust them uh, and wait for until we get the Senate? The evidence is clearly against, right? And let's get to this leadership issue. Uh, January of 2014, not too long ago, the last debt ceiling increase, Eric voted for it. He was one of 28 Republicans, only 28 Republicans, who voted for it, along with all the Democrats. This was the last one? Yeah. January 14. So leadership. That's right. So they knew the other guys, if they, they're going to lose their seats. If you vote for it, it was so bad, right? So Eric and the leadership. Voted with only 28 Republicans, along with all the Democrats, broke up what's called the Hasker rule to increase the debt ceiling. Right? So how are we doing? Not doing well. Uh, principle four is uh, adherence to the United States Constitution. Uh, I'm running on that seriously. I believe in federalism. Uh, the enumerated powers the federal government has certain responsibilities. One is to keep us safe, right? National defense, that's a biggie. And there's some others, but uh, is Fannie and Freddie in the United States Constitution? No. no. Is the Department of Education in the, in the U.S. Constitution? No. no. They're up there just making stuff up by the day. All program after program after program. Right? All of that should be returned to the states. If you took that money, right, the budget, $4 trillion, and returned that to the states, you know what we could do? Right? If you divided that pot up, there's plenty to take care of the poor, right? It's not about taking care of the poor. There's a small number that goes to taking care of the truly taking care of the poor, right? It's just a boondoggle, the rest of the money, right? There's plenty of money to solve basic human needs. So that, that's not the issue. Fifth
fifth principle in the Republican creed is peace is best preserved through a strong national defense. Uh, President Reagan understood that. Today we have ships going through our straits and planes buzzing by us and right, mocking the United States in public for the rest of the world. Uh, Eric has been pretty strong on that issue, right? It's not a, I don't just right, take pot shots at Eric. Uh, it's on principle, right? He's been pretty good on strong national defense, and so I give him where he deserves credit. He deserves credit. I think he rushed a little too quick into Syria, uh, backing Obama on that one, and he's been reluctant. He won't sign on to House Bill 36, which, uh, who put that in, calls for an investigation on Benghazi. Frank Wolf. Wolf. Frank Wolf. Frank. Right, very good, thank you. A fellow Republican. A fellow Republican, right? So he won't co-sponsor an investigation into Benghazi until two days ago. <laughs> right? The smoking gun yeah, came out. Yeah, yeah. It's on paper. He's going to look real bad. So the evidence is in, and all of a sudden, Eric's out, oh, he's, you know, he's going to, I don't know, himself about my God. <clears throat> so on principle, uh, I, don't, I don't buy it. Uh, sixth principle in the Republican creed is uh, we believe in the God of our founders, and that faith leads to strong moral fiber. I uh, could go off all day on that one. But the Judeo-Christian tradition, I think, is responsible for the greatness of the United States of America. <coughs> rights, the whole rights tradition, the term rights doesn't appear until 1400. Right? And it only occurs in Western Europe. Right? So rights go along with the Judeo-Christian <coughs> tradition. Uh, the United States enshrined rights in the Constitution. Other countries, other traditions do not have that rights tradition. Right? I wish they did, because then they would prosper and they would grow as well. I want them to have that, right? but they, they don't have a commitment to individual rights, and we do. So moral fiber, I'll just close with one last little anecdote, and then I'll open up to as many questions as you want. Uh, the, 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 the crucial issue that came up uh, last year, Senator Cruz was up there fighting on the government shutdown, uh, funding Obamacare, uh, the Obama budget, and uh, Eric Cantor goes up to the podium, and has two bills in his hand at the same time at the crucial debate on what to do about Obamacare. So he has one bill, which is A, and then he has another bill called non-A. <laughs> How many of you have had a philosophy course? <laughs> a and non-A, that's called a contradiction. That's a, that's a problem. So he's very clever, so he has a bill in, uh, Bill A is going to defund Obamacare to make you all happy. Right? So I'm against Obamacare, i got a bill, I put a bill in to defund Obamacare. And he'll tell you I put in 45 bills against Obamacare, da 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 da. Somehow it's the law of the land. Oops. Right? Small little detail. Right? So he puts in one bill to defund Obamacare. He has knowing that's not going to go through, and he buckles after about a week or two. 17 days. Right? Then he's got another bill in his hand, and what does that bill do? Fully funds Obamacare and makes no concessions to President Obama on the entire budget and increases the debt ceiling. And that's the one that passes, of course. Is that the one that gave back sequestration? Yeah. yeah, and we lose the sequester. Right? We lost any spending this no, no, that was seven. That's a seven. Obamacare was October. Primary budget was January. Good. No, that's good. Good. Right? So it's that moral fiber. Is, right? I don't, I don't care if people have different principles than you. Go before the American people and say what they are. And then run on them. Right? That's what this country did. It, it, it's not a dictatorship where there's one set of ideas. But go before the people and say, here's what I'm running on, here's the principles I believe in, and it's what I'm going to do. And so I expect you to hold me responsible to that standard too. If I ever lie, term limit me, kick me out immediately. Right? I'm running on term limits. I think 12 years in both houses is the max. Right? Three, three terms in the House, one term in the Senate, and then uh, play tennis with your kid again. Go back. <laughs> With that, I'll just, uh, I, I'm running because I do want to be your representative, and I take that seriously. I'm, I'm not going up there to speak my mind, right? I'm going to represent the views of the 7th District the best I see it, and I'm going around. I'm, I've been to every committee there is, right? I've been to the Republican committees, the women's committees, the Tea Party groups, grassroots groups, rotary groups, right? I've been to every county multiple times. And uh, I do want to represent the people. I'll fight for you on these principles. I'm not a screamer. I'm not a red meat guy, right? Uh, but you don't have to be.
Right? You just vote yes or no. Right? And that's that's power, right? You just put in the right vote, and that'll get things done. And you can, I will go to the podium and explain these things. Right? When I grew up as a young man over there, uh, I always looked up a congressman and I thought that should be my role model. Right? And so I will try to live my life that way. Right? I will try to be ethical. I'll try to be a role model for the kids. And I will try to teach the next generation what's going on on a daily basis. So I'd be honored to be your uh, congressman. And I uh, thank you all very much for coming out tonight.